guess. Correct. Excellent. Okay. Hey everyone, I'm Caroline. Um, and like Eric said, I'm the managing director of the Cancer and Immunology Corps at Vanderbilt, which is in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and my email is there and at the end of the deck if you want to reach out to me. Um, and today I'll just be kind of talking about how we do mass cytometry at Vanderbilt, the core that I run, and how we use the core in um, clinical trials through our medical center. Um, so just a brief history of mass cytometry at Vanderbilt. Um, so we were an early adopter of the technology. We've actually had it over a decade now. Um, so in late 2011, we got our CYTOF-1 originally, and it was in my PI, Dr. Jonathan Irish's lab at Vanderbilt um, for a couple of years before it moved into our flow core. Um, and our flow core is great. It's run by Dave Flaherty. They just got a CYTEC Aurora, so they're moving into the high dimensional space. Um, and as great as our flow core is, it really wasn't the optimal location for this instrument. Um, they just kind of struggled to cost recover and get the, the user base that they needed to support the instrument. So in the middle of 2016, when our medical center and our university um, financially split, uh, we got the site off back and we formed a shared resource, the Cancer and Immunology Corps around it to offer um, fee-for-service mass cytometry to the Vanderbilt community. Um, this was, a lot more sustainable than constantly collaborating with everyone that wanted to do mass cytometry. Um, and it's been really fruitful. And in, so I actually came in early 2016. So I've been with the course since the beginning. I originally trained on the CYTOF-1, which we had beta 17, the 17th instrument in the world. Um, so that was fun, I guess. <laughs> Um, and after about a year and a half, we started the Mass Cytometry Center of Excellence at Vanderbilt, which, where we had an agreement with Fluidime, now Standard BioTools, um, to test reagents, um, provide user data, and um, not like data from our users, but usage of their reagents and that sort of data. Um, and we upgraded to a Helios at that time. So we've had the Helios for about five years now. Um, and just an administrative note, the Mass Cytometry Center of Excellence, the agreement is over, so we merged that shared resource in with our Cancer and Immunology Corps, because um, that made the most financial sense. Um, so if you want to do mass cytometry at Vanderbilt, there's kind of two options. They're now technically one entity, but there's the Cancer and Immunology Corps, which is end-to-end fee-for-service mass cytometry. So literally, you can give me a tube of blood or a cryovial or a chunk of tissue, and I give you data out of that. Um, I'm sorry, I heard a beep. Did someone um, chat something? Okay. Um, and I should say, feel free to unmute and ask me questions or argue with me, or if you want to know more about something, please just let me know. I'd love for this presentation to be a dialogue. Um, so anyway. I have a question, Carol. Oh, yeah, totally. So so you said you can do tumors or blood or different mm -hmm. tissue sections. So mm -hmm. do you charge different processing fees for that or like for different processes if it's a type of sample that maybe you haven't worked with before? Yeah, so we actually, um, we have an ongoing project that fits right into that. Um, so there, the service, what is it? Tissue prep service three on the screenshot of our website that I provided, that's either a tube of blood or a um, a normal sized piece of tissue or a mouse organ or whatever. Um, if it's a new tissue, we can subject it to our standard protocol, which is published. Um, or and or if we need to optimize the pro the um, the protocol, say we have an ongoing project with uterine myometrium, which is a, a very thick muscle tissue. It's I mean, I guess it's probably one of the strongest tissues in the body. Um, so that protocol needed a little bit of optimization for that especially challenging tissue. And we, so we just charge for um, that service one study design can be any kind of, that's really just the time and the, the brain power of the, the CIC um, staff. So we'll just add that onto a tissue prep charge and then work through different yeah. iterations. Yeah. So, so yes, it's the same, but if you want to specialize it, but then once we have an established protocol, then you're not charged that study design fee. And okay. you, might, you might have to pay for extra reagents, um, but yeah. Does that make sense? 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we try and like be as transparent as possible with our pricing. Um, so in the CIC, we have five panels right now that are pretty heavily validated. Um, or sorry, seven, five are human. Three of those are immune. We have a B, a T, and a myeloid cell panel. Um, and then two solid tissue panels. We have one that grew out of a U54 focused on small cell lung cancer at Vanderbilt, and then one that's focused on glioblastoma multiforme, um, so a brain tumor. Um, and then we have two mouse panels, both of which are immune. We have a mouse systems immune panel and a B cell focused um, mouse panel. Um, and I would say probably 90% of our work is human at least, um, but we do have the odd mouse project coming through. And I really like to highlight these services because the VU or the uh, CAC services are all available to outside users. We've worked with um, individuals from the University of Miami, a couple other different um, sites to provide various services. Um, and then originally to support our new Helios instrument, we formed this mass cytometry center of excellence, which is really focused on the users who want to do um, mass cytometry themselves. Um, so who want to touch the instrument, run it, um, run their own samples. They want to use whatever panel they want. They don't want to have to stick to the seven that the CIC sells. Um, and users who want access to Cytobank to do their own analysis. And also the center is what through is how we do um, reagent testing with fluidime and develop new protocols and new panels that end up going into the CIC. Um, and I've just listed all the prices from our website um, just because I find it interesting. We operate purely at cost um, and we do cost recover everything. We don't get any subsidies from the university or from our department or anything to um, provide these services. And I'm particularly proud of our hourly instrument rate, which is twenty six forty seven an hour. Um, and I'm happy to talk offline with anyone who's curious about our service model. OK, um, so we have these two cores and together they um, serve the entire Vanderbilt community and have a set of overarching goals, which is, of course, to support our users at every level um, from the most advanced operator to um, someone who has just learned what cytometry is. Um, and especially in the context of today's talk, we want to focus on expanding clinical research using mass cytometry and high dimensional cytometry in general. Um, and this is where the CIC is really powerful because users don't need to have their own lab. They don't even need to have their own staff. They just need to have access to samples of some kind, which many clinicians do. Um, and for this clinical research, we want to validate and robust reproducible immune monitoring assays, especially because this is an area where mass cytometry can be readily translated to the clinic. Um, and as we develop these assays, we want to move them closer and closer to a place where they're providing clinically valuable information for patients and their doctors. Um, we're not CLIA certified. We talk about it a lot, um, but it would be amazing, right, to do high dimensional immunophenotyping on every patient that came through the cancer center, say. Um, and there's a lot that could be learned from that. Um, and then finally, the you know testing new antibodies, new panels, other tools, and our, our super users. Who have, there's about 10 of them. I won't talk a lot about them today, but we have a delightful community here at Vanderbilt. So when you think of these goals, I think it's important to remember where mass cytometry fits into the cycle of clinical research or as I often refer to this figure, the wheel of pain, because <laughs> it never ends. It just goes around and around and around. Um, it's this iterative process where we take um, samples from patients, subject them to high dimensional immunophenotyping, analyze the data, and then see how that data aligns with clinical outcome. Um, and so in this diagram, I've kind of added around the outside edges. Um, questions that we can answer with a study at different phases in this process. Um, so I'll start at the top. So here we have our patient. They have some kind of tumor. Um, they're receiving treatment at our cancer center. And it doesn't have to be cancer. It doesn't have to be tumor, but often it is. Um, and we get samples over time, either tissue or blood. Um, we do our high dimensional immunophenotyping. And already at this stage, we've learned something about the process and the study that we're trying to execute. We, we've learned if our collection pipeline is working well, how usable are our samples? Are, is the blood just sitting in clinic for hours and by the time we get it, it's all dead, so there's no point. Um, you know, Obviously, treatment of the patient comes first, and so we have to fit into that process, um, not the other way around. Um, so 
after this high dimensional immunophenotyping, we can look at the data in the multidimensional space and we can look at how's our panel working. We can say, yes, we are actually able to collect mass cytometry data on this tissue, a proof of concept experiment. And this can be really powerful preliminary data for a grant going forward to get more money to do more samples and a better panel and really get you know, mass cytometry into an area it's not been in before. And as we look at our data, especially in this case where it's a, a patient over time, we can identify these changes over time, the cells that are changing, their phenotypes, um, abundances. And this area, once we have you know, high quality data, we can really work on a robust analysis pipeline. Um, so I'll talk a little bit later about T-Rex, which is a tool that we use in the lab to identify these changing populations. Um, and these can be really powerful to have a standardized analysis pipeline for clinical studies that you use across studies so you can kind of compare. Um, and then of course, there's data cleanup and batch effect considerations at this phase as well um, that will inform future experimental design. And then finally, at the end, we take our high dimensional data and we hopefully correlate it to clinical outcome. And these are the questions that the clinicians really want answered, right? And the, the humanity wants answered. Is there a biomarker of response that we can detect? using our immunophenotyping? Can we identify who has aggressive disease and who has a more indolent disease that we can kind of sit back and not treat as aggressively? Um, are patients stable in their immune systems? Do they have all the parts of the immune system they're supposed to have to exist in the world and mount healthy immune responses? And then finally, we can, for new treatments, which I'll show you today, we can perhaps identify the biology of the treatment, how it's working in the patient. Um, and perhaps ID possible side effects or things to watch out for. Um, so being a mass cytometrist, I start to answer all these questions um, with panel design. And there's, with 40 plus markers, there's a lot of different um, things you can ask and things you can measure, right? I, I talk a lot about amino phenotyping. Um, and this is where mass cytometry really shines. Can you, you know, phenotype using fewer cells? Um, we talk a lot about collapsing panels down to, so that you need less blood to get the same amount of information. Um, now in the age of immunotherapy, cell-cell interactions are huge. Of course, immune checkpoint, all those sorts of things um, are a really big deal. Um, near and dear to my PI's heart is signaling and function. Um, how are cells responding to these cell-cell interactions or other things in the environment? And then finally, with Again, with 45 markers, you don't have to think about just one or two cell types. You can identify every cell in the sample, just the tissue, the cells that are supporting the immune cells, perhaps, um, and learn a bit, little bit about them. Um, so I get asked, like, what, what makes a good panel, right? And because you have all these things and everyone has one or two markers that they must absolutely have. But a good panel is more of a holistic question, right? And it, so it should phenotype all the known cells of interest that you expect in the sample and provide some information on unknown cells, especially in the case of um, cancer. It's kind of hilarious is the wrong word, but it's surprising sometimes what markers show up on cancer cells um, that you wouldn't expect. Um, a lot of those surface carbohydrate, like touchy things, um, yeah, they're, they're unexpectedly there and it's, it's kind of exciting. Um, ideally also have non-phenotypic readouts, you know, proliferation, cell death, activation events, um, and flexibility from the practical side. You want a few, especially in a core, we want a few spaces in the panel where we can add, that we know are good channels, that we can add maybe a dim must have marker of interest for a PI. Or we, we want to have space to say barcode or multiplex experiments and run multiple samples at the same time. And then from a data analysis standpoint, it's really helpful if the key markers, say your major hematopoietic lineage markers, align across panels um, so you can kind of infer things um, using multiple panels. And then every year we do try to improve the panels in the core. This year we added um, some new reagents that I'll talk about later. Um, but we really always build on existing validated panels. We, I have never sat down with a, just a blank sheet of paper and created a panel. We want to just carefully, slowly over time manipulate and help a panel evolve to be the most current version of what you want it to be. Um, and it's it's easiest to expand the panel by adding new reagents, of course. Um, we added cadmiums this year, I'll show that later. And then we're looking at adding monoisotopic platinum tagged antibodies um, next year. And then finally, from a clinical standpoint, um, 
to be able to run fewer panels is actually better because samples are limited, cells are limited. So the more information you can get from one panel, the better. Um, for the study I'm going to talk about today, um, we developed a panel, which I'm very proud of. Um, it's 45 dimensions. Um, and it was to, it's based on our core's um, T cell panel. So it's designed to really deeply phenotype your T cells, but um, it also gets a lot of other cells, which I'll kind of go through here. Um, so in the center, we just have a Disney of a healthy PBMC sample, and I've kind of expurgated out some um, classic immune populations of interest and color coded them just so you can kind of see everything that we're detecting in the blood with the markers available, which are around the outside. Um, and I've kind of grouped the markers into functional areas or um, what cells they mark. And keep in mind, we're measuring every marker on every cell. I don't think I have to tell this audience this, but, um, you know, just because a marker is classically thought of as important on one cell type, say uh, CB20 on B cells, it's a classic B cell marker. But it's also going to be detected in every other context in which it occurs. For example, when T cells are immediately activated, they express some CD20, and we will detect that. But I still have CD20 here under the, um, the B cell umbrella. So our panel, of course, has um, our major lineage markers. 45, um, we have C66B for granulocytes. Um, this sample is PBMC that I'm showing, and all the data today will be PBMCs. But we include 66B um, just to have the option to do whole blood if that was something we were interested in. It's on granulocytes. Um, CD19 and CD3 for B and T cells, CD4 and CD8 for our T helpers and our cytotoxic T cells, and CD14 and C16 for our classical, non classical, and intermediate monocytes. Um, and then our T cell subsets, we choose to do our T cell subsetting with um, chemokine receptors. It's a little bit easier to stain for a surface marker than it is to stain for, say, an, in, an internal um, cytokine being produced. We don't have to Golgi block. It's, it's just more straightforward. And it's a pretty good T cell subsetting method. And we also have a TCR gamma delta specific antibody for TCR gam for gamma delta T cells. Um, so gamma delta, delta T cells, TH1s, TH2s, TH17s. Um, we have CD25 and CD127, which we use to find our Tregs. We don't have FOXP3 in this panel. We do have it in some panels, um, but our Tregs are going to be 127 low, 25 high. Um, and we also have CXCR5 somewhere here, I think. Yes. Um, for our two follicular helper cells. And then we have several measures of activation in memory and T cells. Um, checkpoint, of course, you cannot have a panel, at least not in cancer <laughs> nowadays, without um, detecting your checkpoint molecules. And we have PD1 and PDL1 in this panel. Um, and we use CTLA4, which requires the gentle perm. Um, we're just using the eBiosciences FOXV3 buffer kit, and that's been working well for us. Um, and then moving out of T cells, we have just things that will be on all cells, all the DNA, um, K67 for proliferation. Um, we're doing membrane perm using a rhodium tagged intercalator, cleavecaspase 3 and FAS for apoptosis and death. Um, and then a whole host of navigation molecules that actually proved really interesting in the study. Um, so these are surface chemokine receptors that kind of tell cells where to go or why. And it, it's an area that I'm not an expert in, but it's quite cool. Um, we can detect hematopoietic stem cells with CKIT, um, natural killer cells with CD56 and CD57, and then our macrophages, of course. So, any questions on any of my markerology or anything? And so we were able to make such a large panel by the addition of several new reagents. Um, so we actually got a fluid I'm now offers a cadmium antibody labeling kit with a special polymer that holds more metal and it's, it's great. Um, and we actually got early access to that. So we were able to conjugate all of our key lineage markers um, to these reagents. And this opened up seven channels in the main body of the panel, because these are markers that we have in every panel, except for, well, I guess, except for C66B, that was a new addition. So six um, channels for other markers in the, in the main panel. Um, and the, these labels are most suited for bright targets. The 106 through 116 is at the very, very lowest end of the mass spectrum, and it gets weaker out towards the edges. So um, CD3, CD8, these are all great markers to put on these channels. Um, we've also used it in glioblastoma with um, some of the extremely bright transcription factors work very well on these um, tags. 
And then just as a note, the 106 cadmium does overlap with 106 palladium, which is in the um, 20 plex barcoding kit that Fluidime sells. Um, we don't do a lot of barcoding, but we did put 66B on that channel so that if we had to drop it for a barcoding PBMC experiment, we could. Um, and I just have some data on the top from that same healthy PBMC you saw on the slide before. And I'm just doing your traditional gating for um, T cells. And so C3 positive, and then you can see C4 versus CD8, quite good separation and minimal um, spill between the different cadmium isotopes, which is great. Um, the signal is lower, it's about a log lower than you would see with the same concentration um, on a lanthanide channel, but it's more than sufficient for um, separating of the major lineages. And then I'm also just taking the not T cells, not B cells, so that CD3, CD19 negative population, and I'm looking at CD14, and C16 for my classical, non-classical monocytes on the right. Um, so overall, 10 out of 10 would recommend cadmiums. Um, so onto the the clinical part of my talk, right? Um, so. I'm using this clinical trial as kind of a, um, a case study of what a normal timeline, sample collection, data quality looks like for a real world clinical study. Um, so here we have THO 1802, which is a phase one, two um, in cancer patients, nivolumab and vorolamib um, clinical trial. Um, so nivolumab is anti-PD-1 and then vorolamib is actually a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So older class of medication, and it's anti-VEGFR and PDGFR. Um, so we got blood from patients before treatment and on day 28 of treatment. And, and I should mention, this was done in conjunction with Katie Beckerman and Leora Horn from the Medical Center. Um, and we first started talking about this clinical trial in 2017, and we did a pilot just to test that the sample collection, a pilot from patients undergoing standard of care PD anti-PD-1 just to test that like sample collection and prep was going as planned. We did that in 2018. And then we did this study in 2018 through 2020. And then we've done another follow And I think I dropped briefly, but can you still see my screen? Yes, you're back now. Huzzah. OK, where did I lose you? Uh, last I heard, I don't know if anyone else heard further, but you're talking about the follow up study. Oh, and perfect. So I barely, barely dropped. Um, yeah, and that follow up study went much, much faster than this. The study I'm talking about today um, because practice makes perfect. Um, so. Um, so we received blood pre-treatment and on-treatment from 32 patients who had um, thoracic tumors, so lung, mostly lung cancer, but also thyroid cancer, um, that was refractory to standard treatment. Um, and it took over two years to collect an, these samples, um, which you always think it'll be shorter, but uh, the more I see, the more th this seems. The um, patient accrual in studies is always slower than the, the MDs expect. Just it is. Um, and PBMCs were viably cryopreserved in our clinical trial processing core, according to our published protocol. And the median cells per tube was about 4 million and with a viability around 90%, which was great. Um, but there was a number of samples that had suboptimal cell counts or viability, which for the core, we characterize that as fewer than 1 million cells or less than 90% viability at freeze. Samples that do not meet both of these criteria, so that do not have 1 million cells and are not more than 90% viable at freeze tend to perform less well downstream. Um, they just thaw out less, not as well. There's more dead cells. You just get fewer events at the instrument. We can still run samples that don't meet these requirements, but just a warning. Um, so acquisition went like this, and I have all the tubes shown just to kind of drive home the, the amount of work that goes into even a fairly small clinical trial study. Um, so we had 32 patients with two time points, which is 64 experimental samples. We elected not to barcode these samples for a number of reasons. Um, first was the viability concerns. If you barcode together 20 samples and one of those samples is necrotic, that can 
um, really tank your cell counts for the rest of the samples in the tube because cells start like, sticking together and they can't be deep barcoded and it's just it's a high risk um, proposition for us. Um, and also that overlap with 106 cadmium, which has CD66B, um, which I mentioned earlier. And then finally, the collection timeline. We were collecting samples through October of 2020, and we started running samples the June before that. So actually two months before the study closed, um, we started collecting samples. So we didn't physically have all the samples together at one time to barcode and run. So we elected to do five batches or six or seven patient pairs. So make sure you run your patients together. Um, plus a apheresis control that the customer provided. So this was just a healthy blood um, that they had split into five tubes, one for each batch. And then we ran what we call the cover our butt control. Um, that was an in-house prepped healthy PBMC with the first batch, just in case we got no events at all from any of the customer samples. We could say, well, we still got, you know, stained healthy events from the blood that we prepped. So it was the samples, not us. Um, and each batch was thawed, stained, and acquired together with an antibody cocktail that was prepared that day. If I were to go back in time, I would have made all the antibody cocktail at the beginning, aliquoted it, and frozen it at minus 80, so that at least I was using the same antibody aliquot for each batch to kind of reduce some of that batch effect. Um, but I cannot go back in time. Um, and samples were stained and acquired from June 2020 to May 2021. So we ran a total of 70 tubes. And of the 32 patients, 25 patients had what we would consider enough data for first pass analysis. So that was more than 5,000 live single cell events per time point. So they had that many for both, for like each one. So 10K for two time points. Um, that's not to say the samples or the patients that didn't have enough cells can't be analyzed. We could find something with that, that cohort of 25 and go back and look for it in the remaining seven. But we just for robustness and reproducibility, we, we do have to have a cutoff, at least for first pass exploratory analysis. So um, something that everyone's probably seen in their studies and we certainly see regularly is some patients barely change at all over therapy. They look essentially the same. So we have patient one tooth, patient 123 on the left, and I'm just showing CD3 versus CD45, and then CD11B versus CD45. So first column is T cells, second column is um, macrophages. And you can see that all the plots, the, the columns look pretty much the same. Like their T cell percentage over therapy isn't changing much, and neither is their macrophage percentage. In contrast to patient 159 on the right, they're almost completely losing their T cells and their macrophages over the course of therapy they're I mean, a very they're changing a lot and so when we look at these changes we ask are there are there common themes in these changes does these changes mean something like did patient 123 like respond really well to therapy and patient 159 died or something like it does it correlate with clinical outcome at all um but rather than manually gating and back and forth and we've developed this algorithm in sierra barone or sierra lima who is now a lab alum, sadly she moved on to industry uh, this, this month. Um, she developed this algorithm called T-REX, which stands for Tracking Responders Expanding. And it's designed for exactly this type of data set. So we have um, multiple time points from a patient. You can also have multiple conditions, say a mouse treated with drug A and a mouse treated with drug B. You can compare those. Um, and we, look for areas in multidimensional space that are either expanding or contracting over the course of therapy. And this is really helpful in cases where we don't know what cells to expect are changing. We can't just go gate for our PD-1 positive T cells and whether they're K or 67 positive or not. Um, we, ha we have to kind of be a little more exploratory. Um, and the hypothesis behind this is that Areas that change consistently across patients will include the cells that are responding to treatment. Um, that those, when those changes are consistent, they're not just noise. Um, and this tool is really, really good for finding rare sample, rare, rare cell subsets that you might miss with, um, say, traditional biaxial gating methods. Um, the output looks like this. So here we have one patient. And on the left, I have a UMAP of their pretreatment blood and their and their post-treatment blood. 
and the dotted line is in the exact same spot on both plots. And what I hope you can appreciate is that that blob on the right is shifting pretty dramatically um, down below that line. And there's a few other changes, you know, maybe the, the blob on the bottom is getting taller. You can see the density, it's more dense. Um, and this is represented in the plot on the right, where areas that are blue are areas that become less populated or less abundant after therapy. So there's more cells in the pretreatment sample in that area. And then red is areas where there are more cells post-treatment, so we call those expanding cell types. And then the gray areas are areas that did not change. They were, had the same amount of cells before and after treatment. Um, and so this patient, their blood changed 7% after treatment. 7% of their cells had a different phenotype, roughly. Um, no. um, and you might say that some of those spots of blue and red look kind of blobby-like, like maybe they're a cluster. And indeed, you can use, um, we use dbscan, you can use a clustering algorithm to, um, in an unsupervised manner, cluster those areas of change into populations. And then using marker enrichment modeling, MEM from our lab, um, we can unbiasedly characterize those populations, give them a label, saying what markers they express, and then perhaps as experts, we could infer what type of cells there are, those are. So I've kind of been following, on the right, there's two clusters, this cluster 205, um, th that is, um, Contracting. I always want to say receding, but it's contracting. Um, and there's CD11B positive um, macrophages of some kind, and they have a little bit of CCR7, which is kind of unique. And there are 4,000 some cells in there, which I think if you do the math is just over 1% of the sample. And that's one of the biggest blobs on the map. There's quite a, quite a few other clusters that are much smaller. And so as this cluster 205 goes away, we have cluster um, 1,195 um, emerging, and that's also a CD11B positive macrophage. It's on the same island, so it's not shocking. It's a similar phenotype, but these cells express a fair amount of CD62 uh, ligands, so maybe they're a little bit more chemotaxic. I don't, I'm not quite the myeloid biologist to be able to infer what that means, but it is a pretty distinct change. And then just another cluster on the bottom, just to show that we're not only detecting macrophages. Um, cluster 695 is emerging, and this looks like some kind of NK cell, I would say. I would have to look deeper and look at that island and see it and make sure it's not a CDA positive T cell. Um, so one, so the great thing about T-Rex is it's patient specific. So this ignores all batches. So those five batches we ran with their different antibody um, cocktails, all of that's gotten rid of and you're only comparing the patient to themselves. And in this cohort of 25 patients, there's a really wide range of change. Um, so patient 159, that patient I highlighted earlier, that was that seemed to be changing a lot, they were changing a lot. They had 75% change. They were like almost a whole new person after treatment. And then that patient 101 that I showed on the last slide, they're kind of in the middle of the pack, you know, seven and a half percent change. And then that fairly stable patient, patient uh, 123 down in the blue box, they had only about 1% change, which is on par with what you would see with a healthy person sampled, you know, a month apart, um, barring in any kind of infection. And so on the bottom, I've just plotted here the degree of change versus the direction of change, which I didn't talk about that a lot. Um, T-Rex also spits out something called direction of change, which is either a positive or a negative number and tells you if more of the cells are in expanding or contracting. We're not sh It's useful to have something to plot degree of change against, but we haven't gone really deep into um, seeing if that is meaningful in this case. And I've just highlighted those three patients I called out on the plot. And this range is pretty consistent with what we've seen in other studies. Um, so on the left is published data from um, Sierra Lima's paper published last year in eLife. Um, and this had, took a bunch of different data sets and ran T-Rex. And you can see um, some patients changed very little. The rhinovirus infected patients and with the green dots are already healthy people that are being challenged with rhinovirus. There's very few changes. Um, same with um, melanoma patients undergoing, I believe, immunotherapy. But then some cohorts like co 
like severe COVID effect infection in the red or um, animal blast crises in the blue have very large change on par with those big changes from our cohort. Um, so you could perhaps infer that there's a, a large range in um, immune stability in our cohort. Um, but so we know that there's changes, but the one downside of a patient specific analysis is we're not, they're not on the same EMAP axes, they're not getting the same MEM labels for their clusters. So we need some way of inferring um, if the changes are consistent across individuals. Are, are we always seeing the same cells emerging with therapy? Are we only seeing a certain kind of cell in, say, patients that do poorly? Um, that sort of thing. So that's the phase of the project we're on right now. And these big old heat maps are root mean square distance, which is each row is one, um, one population identified by T-Rex from one patient. And we're just comparing them pairwise. So it's red along the diagonal because that's comparing a population to itself. So of course it's identical. Um, and you can perhaps appreciate that there are a couple of blocks of like red and yellow where similar populations are kind of grouped together and compared to each other. Um, and we can develop say like a consensus mem label for that, that group of populations and see um, if presence of that population correlates with outcome or um, any other clinical metric. And so we have 56 clusters of similar populations to uh, go through on this cohort. But, and this is a, a work in progress story. So I'd love any feedback on the, the biology or the um, analysis pipeline. That is actually all I have. Um, I'd like to thank my lab. Of course, we just got two new grad students, Claire Cross and Hannah Thurman. So that's very exciting. Um, of course, our VUMC collaborators. Um, and then also I'll be at SIDO next week already. Um, I have a workshop Sunday night, and then I will be chairing the high dimensional cytometry parallel session Monday morning. So, and I'm a shared resource laboratory emerging leader. So I will be at anything that has shared resource in the title um, throughout the, the week. Okay. Thank you, Caroline. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions from the group? Do you have any papers or uh, articles on the T Rex yeah. algorithm? How that works? Um, yeah, that got published last year in eLife. Let me. It's Barone at all. Yeah, let me. Yeah, because that's quite a good paper, and it has it has some really good data sets linked to it. Um, here it is. I have found the DOI. Yeah, it grew out of this collaboration with um, UVA actually, where they were like locking health before COVID, long before COVID, and they were like locking healthy people in a room and giving them um, rhinovirus, and just just to see like what would happen. I mean, like not not like that, but essentially, a sampling blood over the course of infection, and they like they used T Rex to infer where the virus responsive. So they had tetramers against the the rhinovirus, <clears throat> and they used T Rex to infer where the tetramer positive T cells would be in samples that were not stained with tetramers. Um, so it's kind of cool, like the, the virus responsive T cells. Um, Interesting. Were they yeah. able to actually see that? I think so. I am not on the paper, but yeah, yeah. Judith Wood focused the PI at UVA. Um, and Joan Lanigan was, uh, is on it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's actually all, um, so T-Rex actually works equally well on spectral flow data as it does mass cytometry data. Um, 
which is all the data in that paper or the, the rhinovirus data. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. I... <laughs> oh, no, Ben said he has to leave. And thanks. Um, go ahead. I was just going to ask, um, yeah, what, I guess, what, could you touch on, because this is something that I struggle with a lot, and it obviously just depends on project to project and the specific needs mm -hmm. of the project, but your rationale of when to use barcoding and other ways to uh, counterbalance not using it, because I'm also, I, I also am a little leery of barcoding at times, like the, the live cell barcoding is really nice, but yeah, it's, it does take up channels if you're going to do anything more higher plex. So. so dirty little not secret. I've never barcoded anything. Well, OK, I have physically tested the barcoding kit, but we have never run a project in the core that was barcoded. Um, we do what we call is tube coding where they're in separate tubes. <laughs> Um, yeah, because especially in a shared resource setting, we're not doing all the sample prep. We're not storing the sample the entire lifetime. So, yeah, you could tell me that it's 95% viable when you froze it, but like I don't actually know. And it would be a bummer for your whole project to like be way less good because we wanted to save a little bit of time. And it and like you can only acquire five, 500 events per second, regardless, you know, right? So like, if I could go up to like 10,000 events per second, then maybe I'd be like more concerned about bar barcoding, but now it's like, you know, and we'll do batches of like 20, my rec personal record is 30, but we'll regularly do over 20 in a day just to like not have the batch effect and, you know, just, um, right. yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I guess what do you, do you do before you go into a clinical trial? Just again, this is from my own personal interest, but do you do precision studies of the the panel of like how precise intra and inter assays uh, like experiments oh. are from that? You know what I mean? Like, like if like I ran, like if I ran a sample today stained for that panel, the panel I showed, would it? have the same like cell percentages if I ran the same sample exactly next year. Uh, we did a lot of that kind of stuff around when um, when we switched from the Cytop one to the Helios, you know, where we like stained a bunch of samples and ran them like, you know, on the Cytop one and then like on the Helios when it was in the flow core and then after it moved and all that. And those were all really highly reproducible. Um, definitely percentage wise like what you would identify as each cell type like your staining index might vary a little bit right with like in sens instrument sensitivity and like your pipetting and that sort of stuff um and like we you know we have some healthy donors that we run repeatedly and they look like shockingly consistent you know like you can tell who blood it is um yeah I think it's pretty robust. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I agree. The technology itself usually works pretty consistently. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. And then especially if you're doing like the MDIPA or something where like there's no pipetting, there's nothing, you know, I would imagine that's, I mean, we tested the MDIPA kit on site and I didn't love it, um, if I'm being honest. Um, I think I also had the flu at that time. So like maybe, maybe those two are correlated, but like I, I know people who love it and they've done it for like hundreds and hundreds of samples and that's great, but yeah. For sure, I, definitely has pros and cons. I see Jessica joined. I think Jessica, you're our FAS, right? I'm not confusing you. Yeah, hi. 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 Can I ask what, um, just to, I mean, now that you said brought up the MDIP, I'm just curious what you didn't like about, like, what was your. I think we saw like more variability than we liked day to day, which I know is weird. I would have to go back at the back and look at the data. It was like 2018 or something that we tested it. Um, 
and it's also like you know we have panels we like and so i'm like why do you have cd1 in your panel i don't like i don't care <laughs> you know like i think we're like in it deep enough that like i have very strong opinions about every marker um but yeah i think it, it's perfectly fine it, yeah, just, definitely. It it has its um its place for certain yeah for certain people in certain um like areas. But since you guys are such experienced users and you obviously put a lot of time and effort and thinking into your panels, that they're very yeah. like geared towards exactly what you want. And they like have legacy at Vanderbilt, right? Like some version of yeah. our T cell panel has been floating around since 2012. You know. Um, so that's what people kind of expect and it, you know, you know, it works well. And, um, I mean, definitely if I was like starting a mass cytometry core from scratch today, it would be all in dip panel, all path setter, like all automated, like, you know, <laughs> but, um, yeah. Makes sense. I really enjoyed your, your talk also. Oh, thank you. I to say that. Yeah. I, I love talking. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm and also enjoying the, the cat in the background, Eric. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> there's like the cat and the lion painting and the fur on the sofa. It's a whole like vibe, and I love it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, gotta have the basement office set up, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean we're pretty much at the end of our time here, but that was a great talk. And I'm, I'll, I'll probably email you with some questions on T-Rex okay. after I read the paper, but it looks, it's super fascinating, the tool, I think. Yeah, yeah. and everyone yeah. else, email me if you want, or I'm very Googleable. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Well, thank Great. you so much. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Bye. Thank you. Bye.